Well, so I uh, was playing a little bit of uh, Stockhausen at the beginning here. Stockhausen is a name I don't think is mentioned explicitly in the reading, but uh, is a composer who was experimenting with a lot of these early synthesis techniques. And I apologize for my voice. I've, I've been fighting off a cold, uh, some sort of sinus infection thing all week. It's now in my throat, so as you can hear, right? But if you need any voiceover work done, let me know because we can we can talk about that uh, for a Sorry, for a small fee. Nice deep tones. Yeah, in a world <laughs> where, the, where the difference between right and wrong. And you did mention um, Stockhausen the reading we Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, ring modulation with regards to which piece? Did he say or? Um, I can't remember. Yeah. I was trying to remember myself, but I believe it was contact where he was um, ring modulating the sound of the tam tam. Yeah, with an oscillator. Okay. Um, Stockhausen, I mean, uh, I don't know. Uh, he can come across as a little, uh, let's see, intellectual and esoteric, basically, but a lot of the techniques that he was experimenting with, and I truly say, I mean, he is kind of a an experimental composer in the truest sense in that he was experimenting with a lot of these early electronic music techniques and then they eventually go into mainstream experimenting both with synthesis and spatial audio and spatial I mean he would do things like ring the tam tam which is a kind of a big gong okay um, and take the microphone and move the microphone around on the tam tam but that signal would then go into the oscillator get modulated and produce this ring modulation sound so you've got not only spatialization of sound across speaker systems you've got spatialization of the microphone while it's recording basically which is not something you usually right Are those of you that take an audio recording production you usually don't want the microphone moving around while you're recording yes uh, but he was Kind of you know experimenting with those sorts of things so um definitely you can check out some of his his stuff that he was doing in the, the 50s and 60s and hear kind of the the futuristic sounds um, um that would eventually find their way into popular electronic music uh looking at your uh i want to first talk about your reading responses uh we will get to the the synthy today and i'll talk about why i'm using the synthy rather than euro rack today in a, a few minutes but your reading responses, uh, the one word that kind of kept coming up that I had a few people talk about uh, not being clear on is heterodyning. Uh, we've actually been doing some heterodyning here in class. So those of you that kind of caught that term um, and, and caught when we were doing heterodyning, maybe you can explain that for us. Katie, I saw your hand sheepishly go up. Yeah. And then when we were doing ring modulation, and that's when the sounds, or maybe not ring modulation, but it's when the two sounds are like, the frequencies are really close together. And then um, the difference between them is how the beats per minute of yeah. the sound breaks. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So when we had those two oscillators that were closely tuned together, okay, um, the difference between them, that beat that we heard at 4 hertz when I had the oscillators, I think, tuned to 880 and 876, basically, that's heterodyning, okay? Uh, that's heterodyning of two oscillators that are in the audible range, okay? So they're in the range of audible frequencies. Uh, let me ask this question. What's a theremin? theremin. Which sounds like a non selected word, but I'm going to bring it back to heterodyning. Wait, What's that? Um, it's like yeah. So those of you that are not familiar with this, let's see here. If I do some images of a theremin. There he is. There is theremin himself playing his theremin. Okay. So the inventor theremin playing the theremin. Uh, if we could come up with some other way to therem work in the word theremin, basically, we, we okay, have a kind of infinite loop there, basically. The theremin actually is a device that is made up of two heterodyning oscillators. So how it produces its pitch is through the heterodyning of two ultrasonic oscillators. You can't hear, you, it, you actually don't hear the two oscillators in a, in a theremin you are hearing the heterodyning effect of the two ultrasonic oscillators. That's how the theremin works, okay? Heter uh, theremin figured this out back in the 1920s, basically, okay? He was using radio frequencies, right, which are ultrasonic. We don't hear radio frequencies, right? Uh, if we did, God help us, because we would be inundated with radio frequencies all the time, right? But those are ultrasonic frequencies. So heterodyning works whether you're talking about two audible frequencies, two audible oscillators, or whether you're talking about two ultrasonic oscillators, it will produce a tone that's at the difference of the two. Make sense? 
Okay, so that's how that's that's the connection between heterodyning and theremin and electronic music history. This is why it pays to know your history, kids. Right? Okay. Um, uh, does that help clarify heterodyning for those of you that were confused by it? Cool. Um, then we got it. Some of you complained about oh gosh, there's math and graphing and that sort of stuff. Okay. <coughs> um, Hopefully you see the relationship between a lot of the graphs in the chapter and the spectroscope object and the scope object that we've been using inside of Max. Okay, you can think of those as just interactive graphs because you can put in sound to them and get an interactive, uh, you know, uh, get a, a real time update as far as how the sound is changing. Okay. Um, uh, there's not really a way around this because uh, this is kind of what I started alluding to at the end of the fact that we we, we could produce multiple frequencies uh, at the you know the, the carrier frequency and the modulation frequency and then you get a you get a tone at the difference and the sum and those sorts of things okay um, I, I was trying to explain that verbally hopefully reading it on the page and seeing the graphs helped kind of solidify some of that um, the one thing I didn't, I mean, we were running out of time with frequency modulation la, yeah, last class. Uh, I, I keep almost saying yesterday because it feels like just yesterday we were here we were playing with math. Would it help if I really quickly opened up psych, uh, Max just to show you what the frequency modulation graph looks like? Katie's nodding her head vigorously. Yes, so I will go with that. Okay. Um, so in Max, this is just the patch that I uh, had you guys, uh, I gave you guys on Wednesday. Again, I almost said yesterday. Um, what I'm going to do real quick, okay, I, I kind of glossed over the fact that I've got these um, sub patches here, and I don't know, is sub, sub patches might be a new concept for you guys in terms of Max, the fact that you can create patches inside of patches for some of you that are new to Max, okay? So whenever you see a P space, okay, the, the space notation, right, lets you know that you're moving from the name of the object to the argument of the object, right, okay? P, the name of this object is patcher, okay? This allows you to put a patcher inside of a patcher, okay? Uh, we're going to use this more and more as we keep advancing in Max, but for today, the thing that you need to know is that if you double-click on these things, it's actually a patch inside of that little box, okay? It'll open up, okay? It's not that this is a separate file, though. This is saved within your Max patch altogether, okay? Uh, and I said I was going to do frequency modulation. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to copy the spectroscope out of the main patch, and then I'm going to jump into the frequency mod. Oh, nope. I'm going to jump into... No. I'm messing up my keystrokes here. Paste. That's what I wanted. Okay. So I've got a domain from 0 to 5,000. I've got a... Uh, let's see. To be explicit here... This, let me, let me make this a little bigger so you guys can see it in the back. Does that help? Maybe? Okay. And I'll move this up here so I don't have to keep scrolling up and down. Okay. So I'm going to connect that here. This right here is the carrier frequency, or the carrier oscillator. Um, and then this over here is the modulator. Okay, and what happens when we turn this on, which I'm going to have to do by creating an easy deck. I'm not going to connect it to the sound so we hear it. I'm just going to graph it, okay? So if I turn on, I turn up the frequency, you see I get the peak that is my carrier frequency, okay? This carrier frequency is at 1.14 kilohertz. Okay, or 1,140 kilo, or 1,440 hertz. Okay, if I now start to uh, open up the modulator, okay, I need it to have some amplitude. So I'm going to turn that up a little bit. Uh, that that might actually be too big a number. I'll see. And then if I start to modulate it, you see all these side bands that are created here. Okay, so I'm now getting side bands at. Uh, 1140 plus 270 plus 2 times 270 plus 3 times 270 plus 4 times 270 plus 5 times 270 and, and infinitely okay now I, I say infinitely but you how many do you count there in terms of sidebands yeah three on each side right okay uh, what happens to the other ones right where are they okay because it is infinite okay 
That's where the amplitude comes in. If you increase the amplitude of the modulating frequency, those sideband peaks start to grow. See what's happening here? So I, they're there, they're just really quiet, okay? And by increasing the amplitude of the modulating frequency, that's how you bring them out. That's how you start to amplify them, okay? And then to the point where you actually get a little bit, you get more, uh, the carrier frequency is starting to be diminished there, okay? And probably what's happening is, uh, because they're infinite, okay, this is where Nyquist and his pesky theorem comes back into play, right? Okay, because they're infinite, they're going to keep going out beyond the Nyquist frequency on the upper end and beyond zero on the lower end, and they're going to fold back into the audible range and start interfering with each other, okay? Uh, sometimes you want this because you want just crazy amounts of sine waves happening all over the place and you like what it does to the sound basically but if you're trying to control things know that Nyquist comes into play here basically things are gonna fold back into the audible range because of the Nyquist theorem okay so does this help to start to see all these sidebands okay and see it interactively in terms of what happens uh, are you curious what this sounds like I'm kind of curious what this sounds like so I'm gonna turn I'm gonna connect Okay, I might want to turn down first. Ooh, yeah. So I can turn them down. Oh, lock. Yeah, you see? Turn that down real quick. You see these diminishing ones here? That's actually ones that are going like this, but they're folding back into the audible range. So this is probably the, the third or fourth one off to the side, basically. It looks like that's probably the carrier. Then this, this is the first sideband. Second sideband's already folded back in, then the third one, fourth one. So we're getting those sidebands folding back in, OK? Yeah. So is that symmetric to the zero line? Like the line? It will be symmetric to, yeah, to the zero line, OK? And they fold back in in a linear fashion. What now? Uh, that's because I had this set to 270 before, but I just turned it up. Okay, it's going to be based on whatever the frequency is, and the amplitude affects the amplitude of the carrier, or the excuse me, the modulator affects the strength of the sidebands, how loud they are. The frequency of the modulator controls where the sidebands are. Okay, um, and then the carrier is I mean, is going to control where the center of that frequency is. Okay. Uh, now, uh, where ratios come into play, um, I, I, ratios you don't really start to see until you get into digital synthesis. So we're going to be doing an analog hardware day, basically. It's not really, uh, see, I don't want to say it's not feasible. It's harder to do ratios on, a, on an analog synthesizer, okay? One of the benefits of the, okay, so FM synthesis is really the basis of the Yamaha DX7. Is that a name you've heard before? Ian's shaking his head. What, where have you heard Yamaha DX7 before? Um, it was a synthesizer they put out in the 80s. Mm -hmm. um, it was for the first to employ frequency modulation synthesis. Um, but it was in a digital format. Not yeah. The format. Yeah, this is a digital synthesizer that used FM synthesis as its basis. Okay, um, it used a an algorithm that was developed by John Chowning at Stanford, um, and uh, he licensed it. And this was really one of the first uh, cheaply available digital synthesizers to the point where if you were an '80s new wave hair band, you had to have one of these for your setup, basically. Okay, so. Uh, a lot of those 80s bands like Depeche Mode, like Flock of Seagulls, like, I don't know, you name them basically, they probably had a DX7 somewhere in their rig and they were, uh, this was kind of the sound of 80s music here, right here, synthesizers, okay? Uh, we actually have a Mark II DX7 over in the, in the, the recording studio. Uh, you may not realize it's been sitting over in the corner. Colby is supposed to be uh, refurbishing it, trying to get it back up into running and he's, he wants to develop a tutorial for it basically, but know that we have one of these in our gear box too, okay, so uh, for checking out. Uh, nowadays, most people will use a software synth to emulate the DX7, basically, uh, but we have one of the one of them uh, over in our collection. Uh, it's one of those things that I'm not letting it go because it's a piece of history, really, is what it comes down to, okay. 
Um, but the DX7 deals with them in terms of ratios. And when you get into ratios, you're basically describing the ratio between these two frequencies. Okay? By setting them in ratios, you can better control harmonic relationships, right? Because harmonic relationships are defined by ratios, one to two, four to five, those types of relationships. Okay? So that's that's where the DX7 and digital synthesis gives us a little bit of an advantage. Okay? Uh, does that help? clarify okay some things from the chapter with the graphing and the maths and the ratios um, yeah I have a question. so like the difference between like amplitude modulation and like frequency modulation mm -hmm. is that amplitude modulation will only have like a lower and an upper side of band yeah. is that it but then frequency modulation will have an infinite number yes on the other side. amplitude modulation gives you two side bands okay. fm modulation gives you infinite side bands okay. ring modulation Gives you two sidebands, but the carrier frequency is missing. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's those are the differences. Okay. Now we're doing this. With, keep in mind, we're doing this with sine waves, right? Okay. So it's because they are sine waves. It's because they are single frequencies that we get a sideband. Okay. Once you start introducing more complex signals into the mix whether those be triangle or sawtooth waves, or whether those be your voice, or whether those be tam-tams, okay? You're now creating sidebands for every frequency in that complex spectra. Should I say that again? Okay. Uh, some of you, like, it's washing over you at 9.30 in the morning. You're kind of, okay. You're now creating sidebands at every frequency in that complex spectra, okay? You start with a carrier frequency, a carrier oscillator that is, an, a sine, that is a sine wave, okay? But then if you feed in a modulator that is a more complex spectra, like a voice, like a tam-tam, like a guitar, like a insert name of complex spectra here, you're now modulating, you're creating sidebands at every one of the frequencies, the constituent frequencies in that complex spectra. That's why you get such complex sounds out of ring modulation and amplitude modulation when you're talking about voice or guitar or that sort of stuff, okay? It's just a lot easier to see and graph when it's one-to-one, -one, right? Okay, um, so why would I, why am I interested in modulation synthesis? Can we answer this question yet? Why did we just spend a week talking about modulation synthesis? Because it's cool, okay. <laughs> yeah, if you take the time and you kind of understand what's going on, there's a lot you can do in terms of generating interesting timbres, right? Um, the other thing, I mean, the, the, the really practical interest that happened and part of the reason why Yamaha was so keen to license the FM synthesis uh, algorithm from John Chowning to turn it into a commercial synthesizer is because you can get, uh, think about it this way, getting infinite sidebands, infinite oscillators out of two oscillators, think about that just from a, a price standpoint basically, right? Right? If I, can, if I can control the ratios and the math involved in two oscillators and get infinite uh, frequency components for my spectra, for my sound, right? That's a lot better than me having to build a chip that has, you know, 20 oscillators in it, right? I can get more complex sounds out of two oscillators in a frequency modulation configuration than I can out of 20 oscillators in an additive synthesis configuration, okay? Uh, sorry, I dropped that name in there that we haven't really been using this week, but it was mentioned in your readings, yes, okay? Additive synthesis, we just add up a bunch of oscillators, okay? So uh, let's try to get some, F some modulation synthesis out of this EMS synthy, okay? Uh, and because I, I will, okay, I mentioned earlier, I was going to tell you why I'm, uh, why I'm here with the Synthi and not with the Eurorack. I spent about an hour to an hour and a half yesterday afternoon trying to get modulation synthesis sounds out of the Eurorack. And because there is only, there's one oscillator in that rack and it has an LFO, but it would, it, so you can turn up the LFO to get, start getting modulation synthesis effects, uh, but it's, it's not as clear as it is with the synthy, okay? So I, I thought it would be better to demo with the synthy. It's not that you can't get out of the, out of the Euro rack, it's just, it, I found that it was more limiting because we don't have uh, more than one oscillator in that rack, and 
none of the oscillators of that rack are sine waves, so that ma that automatically made them more complex sounds. Okay. Um, what I did get out of it was I was able to ring modulate some of the. Uh, if you remember, there were some there's some modules on there that generate percussion sounds like hi hats and claps or, oh, it's hi hats and rim, rim shots. I was able to actually ring modulate those with the oscillator using there's there's a module on there called the demix modulate. There's actually a, mo a module in there for modulating two signals together. Okay, um, so it is possible if you're interested in that. Let me know. We can maybe look at that as a sidebar one of the days that I bring in the Eurorack. But let's talk about the Synthi today. Uh, and because there's only one at the front of the room and that sort of stuff, and you might want to actually be able to see what we're doing or try some of this out, I wanted to point you out to one thing that was mentioned. If you remember when Jeff was here, he mentioned that there's a JavaScript version of this. Okay, This actually runs in the browser. So if you type in, if you've got your browser open in front of you, type this in, this web address that I've got here, uh, and it will open up a JavaScript simulation of this, of the Synthi, okay? Um, so you can kind of follow along with this. <clears throat> okay. You can follow along with this. It is not a perfect facsimile of the Synthi, though. Okay, I will tell you that. Um, and the, uh, I actually emailed this week um, Alex Nisnevich, okay, the guy who did this, because he did this fairly recently within the last couple months, okay, uh, programmed this and, um, and added it in, okay. Is it giving you a 404 error? What, what's going on there, Christian? No? Okay. Or if you Google synthy-js, it should come up. It'll take you to the GitHub page, which is where the source code is, and then there's a link right on the page that says, try online now, or something like that. Okay. I figured I'd put this in front of you because I, I want a volunteer to come up and be our, our, our patcher to get this uh, working here with the actual Synthi. Uh, but I figured you could also follow along with this JavaScript Synthi. So uh, the other thing I wanted to mention here in terms of contacting um, Mr. Nesnevich, uh, he created this without having access to a an actual synthy of himself. He created this bit using the documentation that's available freely online that people have scanned and put up as PDFs, basically. Um, and when I contacted him and said, hey, this is great. This will be a great learning tool for my students. When they can't get in the studio, they can try stuff out before they come into the studio. Uh, he immediately was interested in the fact that we had a working synthy and trying to get his JavaScript version to be more like the actual synthy. Uh, and so looking ahead to final project time, where your final project is to solve a problem for someone else using sound, okay? Uh, Mr. Nisnevich is someone else. The synthy produces sound. This might be an opportunity for a final project for one of you to collaborate with him. He's out in California, so it would be a, a bi-coastal affair basically working with somebody but what I can't think of a better real world scenario than someone who's created a facsimile of something and wants access to like what the real thing sounds like that might be an opportunity for one of you for a final project okay so teasing you with that okay so I've also talked about parallel and uh, series so let's get two uh, oscillators in parallel if we can and try to uh, get some heterodyning effects here on the synthy, okay? Who would like to be our volunteer today? I'm going to move this over here. I'm going to check my camera angle real quick. Would someone like to patch at the synthy today? Someone who hasn't before. Have you? I haven't. You haven't? Come on up, Andy. Um... I'm just checking to make sure that we can actually see the synthy. There we are. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, I don't know that it's useful to put that up there. Uh, okay. So parallel oscillators. Okay, so turn it on. How do you turn it on? Can you see that? Does, that, does the JavaScript facsimile have an on-off switch? There it is. Okay. No? There's no on-off switch. Okay. Um, in order to get a sound, so you've got, I already placed a pin in there for you because I was testing the sound. So what, what, what direct them, what did, what did, what's co what the connection uh, there? Output to oscillator one. So output at the top, output one at the top. And it should be coming through, oh, I need to turn it up.
Okay, so he's got his at a super low frequency. And that's one of the things I noticed on this JavaScript oscillator is that it's, it doesn't go quite as low as this. What frequency do you guys have? See if you can get find 440, okay? So oscillator one. Yeah, the numbers don't necessarily correlate to the frequency. So if you're reading the numbers. <laughs> Keep going up. That's they're like it's two octaves too low, so keep going. Now you're still an octave too low, right? Are we close enough? We're in the range, right? Oops, sorry, Bob. We're close. And now, actually, we're creating some heterodyning in the room, right? Because you guys are out 440, right? Okay. So, if we want to have two parallel oscillators like this, what kind of what connection do you see? We have a second oscillator there, yes? So if we take oscillator two and patch it into the same output. Okay, so now take your second oscillator and tune it so that you get some heterodyning effect. What's the default then? Is it defaulting to 440 as well? You're too low. Are you too high? Different. The numbers really mean nothing, do they? Ah, you're right there. So, what's your what's your overall impression, Anthony, in terms of the knobs and turning? The numbers are pointless. The number. Okay. <laughs> so the so don't look at the numbers. You you got you have to use your ears basically if you're trying to tune this thing. The other thing is that it's very touchy. That a little bit of turn on the knob results in a big change in frequency if you're trying to find an exact pitch, okay? Okay, but we can, let's see. There we are. And if I touch one of them, I mean, I literally, all I had to do was like squeeze the knob and it moved a little bit and now I'm out of, now they're out of tune. Do so you hear them? There's a little bit of a warble there. Okay. Now this is parallel. They're both in the same speaker. They're both over there. Okay. What was the other thing I did with uh, two, I've got two speakers. What can I do with two oscillators then? Yeah, I can patch one to the other channel. Okay. You should be able to do the same here. So. If you change one of your oscillators to the other channel, it should start coming out of two ears. It's going to get kind of noisy in here. <laughs> what Maybe I'll do this. Because I'm curious whether the sound's going to come out. Because I'm, I'm using the microphone over there. I'll kind of hold this. I'll be uh, Bob Barker today. Okay. Okay. Um, so we've got two oscillators going to two different channels, okay? Uh, that's this parallel configuration. If we now want to do something in series, which is what gets us to modulation synthesis, we now need to take the output from one of these oscillators and feed it into, uh, what do you guys want to do first? You want to do frequency or amplitude modulation? Amplitude, okay. So let's take oscillator two, okay? And if we patch it into, what is it called here? Oscillator frequency. Output channel level. I think that's what, it's, it's called output channel level here. What is it called there for you guys? Yeah, so what, you, what you're doing is you're taking the oscillator and you're modulating the output level. The output level is the amplitude, okay? 
This is where it pays to make sure you know the terminology and you know what the, the synonyms are for different things, right? Level, amplitude, volume. People use a lot of these terms interchangeably, okay? So now we're, now oscillator two is modulating the level of amp oscillator one. So if you start to change oscillator two's frequency now, Lovely. Make sense? So, I mean, with it's it's really not that hard to get the amplitude modulation out of this. Two pins, right? We got amplitude modulation. Are you hearing the effects of this on your machines? Do I need to turn this down for a minute so you can hear? Yeah. Are you hearing amplitude modulation on your machines? That's my question. Yeah, that's, is that all coming out of your machine? No, you've got one. Uh, oh, you did um, oscillator three? Yeah. So move up a pin and then remove that one. Now turn this down. You have to, you have to literally. So are we not hearing? Uh, somebody's got amplitude modulation. Or did we just have two different frequency oscillators going on in the room? Maybe that's two different machines. Yeah. What no? the yes. Yeah. Yeah, that looks, his looks right. It needs to be the same channel. Mm -hmm. That should do it too, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Is that making sense? Yeah, so to get amplitude modulation, you would move this pin over to here so you're controlling the level. You've got it. Yep. Yep. Just make sure this is in the same channel. This is channel one. So you want this to be channel one, this to be channel one. Okay. Now you should be amplitude modulated. Uh, uh, two. Yeah, this is oscillator. Uh, yeah, oscillator two square. Yeah, because it's like oscillator one, oscillator one, and then so turn up the level three. maybe. Are you yeah, I can hear you it. can hear it. Okay, okay. So I'm just checking with a few people. It seems like people have it. Okay. So I'll put uh, uh, and then turn up the square level. There it is. Yeah. So I have a question. Uh, what's the difference between square one and triangle? The shape. Both of them are coming from oscillator two. Yeah, but I didn't hear any difference. Uh, okay. This it's one muted. Like it's more muted. It's yeah. because of the shape of the harmonics. It's going to be different. Okay. Okay. So we've got amplitude modulation. Let's see if we can get frequency modulation out of this thing. Okay. So two pins. You see the configuration to get amplitude modulation. Where do we go from here? Turn it back up. Turn that back up. We're staying in channel one. Instead of oscillator two controlling the level, we want it to now control the frequency, right? So you should see across the top the frequency of oscillator one, where you can patch it in and actually control the frequency of, of oscillator one. And this is where, uh, again, some of you had the, the level of oscillator two. Uh, when you patch in oscillator two, there's also a knob that controls the level of each of the, the oscillator shapes. You have to turn that level up in order to hear the modulation effect. For you, it'd be this. There's the, there's the carrier frequency. So I just turned down the level. There's the carrier frequency. If I turn up the level, that's all the sidebands coming on on the. Okay, and in fact, if I turn down the frequency of the os the modulating oscillator.
Can you start to hear the wee, 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 wee? Okay. That's really slow frequency modulation right there. I've basically turned the modulating oscillator into uh, a low frequency oscillator range. If I turn it up, then I start, that's where I start to hear the side bands. Lovely, right there. Okay. Okay. So we've done amplitude modulation, frequency modulation. Are you seeing how to do this? Does anybody want to s swap out with Anthony and do it on the? Yeah. Okay. I'm like going back to the other stuff. I still had no idea. Remove that one's not doing anything. The 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 second one. That. Yeah. Feel free to, I mean, play with these. This is your carrier frequency. This is your modulating frequency. Yeah, come on. Yeah. What now? This is carrier. That's, yeah. So right now, and if, if you feel like, let's see, let me ask. If you feel like the JavaScript's not helping you and you want to see the real thing, feel free to come on up. That's fine with me, okay? Yeah, right now the way we've got it configured, oscillator one is the carrier, oscillator two is the modulator. Okay, so this is going to move the whole spectra back and forth if we start changing that. Go ahead. Yep. Now, if you you get that up in the that now, yeah, now now you're modulating those sidebands. You're moving them back and forth. The carrier is staying stable, and the modulating bands are moving back and forth. How are we on time? 